Welcome to Literature Out Loud, sponsored by RMU Radio and Rune, the Robert Morris University Literary Magazine. I'm John Lawson. I'm joined in the studio today by RMU student Danielle Kayser. Hi, Danielle. Hello, Dr. Lawson. Our guest on Literature Out Loud is Gertrude Matchy. Among her many other accomplishments, Gertrude is a poet, memoirist, entrepreneur, actor, and playwright. She was born in Zimbabwe and lives in New Zealand. Gertrude is currently serving as the Rooney International Scholar here at Robert Morris. Gertrude Matchy, it's a privilege to welcome you to Literature Out Loud. Thank you, Dr. Lawson. It's a pleasure to be here. Your life story is so rich and varied that there's no way to do it justice in the time available to us today, so I'd like to focus as much as possible on your writing. To give our listeners a sense of the breadth of your writing, I wonder if you'd mind starting us off with a poem, and then perhaps we could move to a passage of prose from your memoir. Awesome. I'd love to do that. I'm going to start with a poem that I wrote for my mother. Um, uh, I was actually returning from the United States, and I was flying over the Swiss Alps, and I looked outside the window and captured this view. My mom was very anxious when I left home, so this was a little poem to her. It's entitled, The Swiss Alps, A Bird's Eye View. I too saw God through fog, high upon high, where clouds and mountain peaks do meet, and frozen lakes and icy falls are there untouched to keep, and crimson sunsets merge gently by where white clouds lie, and if I die, my soul to keep, please mama, do not weep, for I saw God's majestic beauty sleep. Mm. Wonderful. That's beautiful. Thank you. Now you've written this memoir titled Born on the Continent, Ubuntu. What does that term mean, Ubuntu? Ubuntu is a Zulu word. It's actually a philosophy, which literally translated, we would say, Ubuntu Gamuntu Gavantu. The literal translation is, I am because you are. So I could not be human unless you were human, acknowledging my humanity and vice versa. It's a philosophy that talks about empathy, it talks about compassion, but most important, it talks about the connectedness of humanity, that we are one, we are one organism. But somewhere in the evolution of mankind, we've forgotten this. So I decided to use it as the subtitle to my book and the subcontext to the book, and wove the Ubuntu philosophy in all my stories. Mm. That's, that's pretty. Uh, would you read a passage from the book? Yes, I would love to read a passage. I picked an interesting passage. It's all about my English teacher, the man who inspired me to write. His name was Mr. Davies. <clears throat> I remember my Form 3 English literature teacher, Mr. Davies, a tall, thin man with shaggy brown hair and brown eyes, who always seemed to look scruffy, even though it was first thing in the morning. Mr. Davies came from England and he helped to cultivate the passion and love I have for English literature. He introduced us to African literature and the writings of famous authors like Ngugi wa Thiongo and Nchea Chebe. Later, I studied their work for A-level English literature exams and their writing helped me to clarify in my mind the effects of colonialism had had on my people. We were living in a post-colonial era, and the effect and impact of the English language which was brought to Africa was considerable. They addressed the implications and the way English had affected the intellectual makeup of the African people. In his book, Decolonizing the Mind, Ngugi teaches about the effects of the British Empire and how Europe had planted its memory on the newfound landscape by exploration and by naming places. For example, in the United States, places like New York, New, New Jersey, uh, New Cleveland, New England, New Orleans, were an effort by the British to erase the old names and establish the new. So the previous memory, the pre-New York is no longer there 
and New York becomes the starting point and the fundamental memory of that place. In Zimbabwe, we were taught in our history class that David Livingston discovered Victoria Falls in 1855. But what was it called prior to that date? Did he not discover it? He was the first white man to see it, yes, but he did not discover it. It was always there. And it was called by the local Batonga people, Mutsuwa Chunga, which means the smoke that thunders. That name has now been lost in history and it is difficult to bring it back. Even 20 years after Zimbabwean independence, the fear is that people will not know what we're talking about if the name is restored. Hence, the new memory becomes the fundamental memory of that place. It's the Victoria Falls instead of Mutua Chunga. You know, Gertrude, uh, listening to you read, it would be it, unbelievable that English was not your first language, <laughs> but I understand that it wasn't. Uh, what other languages did you grow up speaking? I speak Shona. My mother tongue is Shona, which is the predominant African language in Zimbabwe. I'm married to a man who is Devele, so I speak a bit of Devele as well. And by living in South Africa, I had to learn Afrikaans, and I also picked up um, a bit of Dutch because of Afrikaans language is very much Dutch-based. But the South African language that I learned while I was there was um, Zulu and Kosa. So what does that mean in terms of how you actually transact your own <laughs> internal thinking and, and your writing? Do you think first in some other language and then sort of go through a process of translation or do you? It's interesting because I think I think in both. <laughs> there are some mornings where I wake up with a poem in Shona that I translate into English and it's perfect. Majority of the time, I think I would have to say I do think in English more than anything else because I'm living in an English speaking environment. I communicate a lot more with English than in Shona. So English has got a very, very big influence. But I sometimes hear the Shona nuances creep into the English sometimes, which is pretty interesting. Indeed. Yeah. Um, are your works available in Shona? No, everything I've written is in English. Many writers talk about the ways that their environments affect their writing. The landscape, the people, the culture. You lived in so many places. Zimbabwe, London, Norway, South Africa, New Zealand, the US. Do you notice changes of location affect your writing? Definitely. I've had people tell me who've read the book that the pace of the book changed when I left Africa. I think because Africa's pace is very, very slow mm -hmm. and the way I told the stories when I was still in Africa was kind of in my grandmother's tone because my grandmother was an amazing storyteller and yeah, I have a lot of people who say that when they get to the part where I'm in New Zealand, the book tends to speed up and I'm not as slow in describing mm -hmm. things the way mm -hmm. I, I did when I was in Africa. So yeah, definitely the pace. <laughs> Interesting. <coughs> You've described your life's purpose as to serve as the voice of Africa. What does it mean to serve as the voice of a continent and why do you feel that Africa needs a voice? I come from an environment where when I say a voice, people do not have an opportunity to share their stories. An environment where there's no technology, um, you don't have access to the outside world really the way you do in the West and I think I've been privileged to be where I am to have traveled in all the countries that I've traveled to and there are a lot of voiceless people out there and especially Africa's children and Africa's women so I guess when I took on the role if you like I just felt that I have a voice that people listen to it's a gift and I think I, I need to use it to the maximum to share our stories. That sounds like a major responsibility that you've it's taken huge. on. It's <laughs> huge. It is huge. What books have you written and how are they available? Uh, the two books that I have in hard copy are Born on the Continent Ubuntu 
and another book called It's Not About What Happens That Matters. They're both available on Amazon and on my website, which is africalifeonline.com. I have several ebooks that I've written in the last few years. Um, one is called Speaking from the Heart, where I basically coach inspirational speakers how to deliver authentic presentations. I wrote a book called How to Grow a Money Tree, <laughs> which is really how people can take their ideas and, and monetize them and turn them into money. I wrote a book called The Property Squillionaire, which is a book where I coach people who want to go into property investing because I have a property investing business. And Living the Secret is the other book that I've written. And I'm also currently working on another book called The Power of Giving, which I'm hoping I'll have out by the end of the year. It's great. My oh, gosh, I knew you'd written a lot of stuff. <laughs> I didn't realize it was that much. Um, I mentioned earlier that you have experience both as an actor and a playwright. Would you talk a bit about writing plays and how your experience as an actor influences your playwriting? Well, the plays, again, to me, it's just storytelling. <laughs> I actually wrote the first play when I was 19. World Health came to our village in a helicopter, educating people about HIV and AIDS by dropping flyers and free condoms. But half of the people in our village could not read or write and they were picking up the papers and lighting their fires and i realized that the campaign was very ineffective and the way we pass down knowledge in africa is through stories every story my grandmother told me had a moral had a lesson to it so i, I wrote back to world health and i was sponsored to write a play with an aids theme to it which i would go and perform in all of the rural villages my group was called just for women theater and my mission was to reach the rural Zimbabwean woman who hasn't gone to school and empower her with the knowledge of what AIDS was about and how the virus was spreading. My acting has been very influential in the way that I write. I think when you've been on stage, you know what it's like as an actor. So it does make the playwriting process to be a little bit easier. So definitely, I think my acting has helped in that sense. Indeed. Mm. Uh, and I understand that you have a screenplay underway as well. Yes, yes. I'm actually working on a screenplay based on my book. Um, I realize that not many people are aware of how much HIV and AIDS has affected Africa. You know, when I give my presentations and talks and I talk about how the life expectancy of a Zimbabwean female is 34 and 37 if you're male, it's a shock. I can see you're shocked. <laughs> not many people know this story. and. When I moved to New Zealand, I got the opportunity to work with Peter Jackson when he was filming King Kong. Had a part as an extra in that film, took part in Avatar, and it inspired me to go back to school and do a course in TV and film production. And I started writing a film script based on my book. So film, when you think about these big blockbuster movies, you can reach millions of people with that kind of film. If I did a documentary about AIDS, I don't think anybody would watch it. And I think my film is going to be one of the first spiritually healing films ever made. The reason why I had to find a mass way of reaching people is because we're dying by the thousands in Africa. I have a lot of people I need to reach with this movie and it's all about us changing our minds around the disease. Poverty, AIDS is a story. And when you buy into a story, it's like cancer. If somebody tells you you've got six months to live, Guess what, if you believe that story, within six months you're dead. And this is what's happening in Africa with AIDS. The minute somebody's diagnosed HIV positive, it's now a belief system. You watch your uncles, your aunts, your cousins dying around you, and people have lost hope. So that's what the film is going to be about. I know that you personally have lost relatives, and uh, both on your side and your husband's side. Yeah. You've worked in many different fields. As an actor, a COBOL programmer, a fashion designer, a systems designer, and project manager, <laughs> and the list goes on. How have those experiences affected your writing? They've impacted dramatically on the way that I am. Um, I'm one of those people who does multiple things at the same time. I think when I was little, I was probably ADD. <laughs> My poor mother, um, she said that I would start something and stop and start the next thing and stop and start the next thing, but I got everything done. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of impacted on me in a number of ways because with the COBOL programming, for example, and just being in the IT 
field, I have a very systematic way of doing things, which has helped in terms of my writing. Fashion designing, it's again creativity. It's like, how do I create something out of nothing? And when I'm writing, I, I kind of tend to go back to that and I, I have to create from nothingness. And it's a beautiful space because it works both in art and in literature and in writing as well. So yeah, I think my many lives have helped. <laughs> Am I in correct in assuming ways. that you uh, designed and created the garment that you're wearing? I was just yes. going to ask that. <laughs> yes, yeah. I did. This is a tie dye. So I dyed the fabric and I, I made it as well. And I did all the embroidery. So it's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. That is beautiful. Thank you. Uh, that, turning to your early days as a writer, why did you start um, and who inspired you? Okay, that's an interesting question. I started because I was stuck. Um, I went to white schools. If you know anything about Zimbabwean history, we had a very similar apartheid system to South Africa. And my parents realized that they had to educate their kids, we had to go to really good schools, and they were always private schools and they were always white owned. In fact, my sister and I were always the first two black kids in every school I ever went to, and nobody would play with me. So I, I was a bookworm, I stuck my head in books, and I think that's really where it started. The books and the stories were an escape for me in that environment. That's really where it started. Interesting. Mm. I saw the same phenomenon in a certain way uh, from the other side. I was in the segregated South as I was growing up. and. Uh, so you can relate to what I'm saying. Right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, often when I teach m my students about writing, um, they don't immediately perceive a um, connection between reading and writing. Um, and for that reason, I'd like to ask what you're currently reading and how you see reading and writing connecting in your own work. Okay, I, I, okay that's interesting. Okay, so right now I'm, I'm reading a couple of books. One is called The Way of the Wizard Merlin by Deepak Chopra. And it talks about living backwards in time, seeing the end before you start things. Fascinating book. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I picked it up again, I had read it a few years ago, but it kind of helps me, I guess, tap into my future self to ask myself how I'm going to achieve what I want to achieve right now. It's a beautiful reminder in that sense, and I've got a number of goals that I'm trying to to reach by the end of this year. Like uh, I think I might have mentioned to you before that I'm trying to build a medical center and a library in my village. So I, I picked that book up again and it is helping me just clear my thoughts because I believe that we have all the answers to all of our problems. We're born with all of the knowing of how we're going to do what we're going to do. And your future self knows how you're going to get there and you can actually ask yourself those questions and come up with the solutions. The other book I'm reading is called Restoring the Sacred Hoop by Jerry Bakanga. He is an American Indian writer. And because I'm working on a series of seven portraits, they are pictures of people who've inspired me. In fact, when I walked into the room, I, was quite, I mentioned that you've got uh, John Lennon, Jimi Hendrix on the wall. These are people who have inspired me all my life and they're part of my series of portraits. So there are people who have taught me how to dream. Imagine was a song that I just absolutely love, just imagining this other world. I'm painting Mother Teresa, Oprah, uh, Martin Luther King, President Obama, and Gandhi. And the series is going to be called The Healing of the Sacred Hoop. So I am combining two mythologies, my Ubuntu philosophy and an American Indian philosophy, where we're all saying the same thing, which is that humanity is one. And that at some point we were all connected. In an American Indian mythology, they say that the four nations broke away. This is why the world is in all of the problems it's in. And it's time that we all come back together again and create a healing. In Ubuntu, my grandmother would say that the human race is like the human body. That if you start to bleed, when you cut yourself, your white blood cells will rush to that point to heal it. In a week's time, you can't even see the scar. And that's how we should be responding to each other in the world. So that if the seven billion people on this planet hear that there's an earthquake in Haiti, mm -hmm. and we each give one dollar, guess what? Haiti is going to be restored in one day. 
but humanity has forgotten this. We're all living in this in not enoughness mentality. So that those are the two pro projects I'm working on right now, and I'm, I'm having fun with it. And yeah, reading the books definitely helps with the creativity. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you've set yourself such small goals. <laughs> <laughs> Could you describe your, your writing process? How did you get started in your writing? Oh, my writing process. Like I said, I, I, I wake up sometimes with, with words in my head. I wake up, especially the poetry, the words just come out perfectly. I actually have to get to a pen and paper fast enough to download. <laughs> I, I call it downloading. Most of my writing is inspired. Normally it's something emotional. It could be an incident. It could be an event that is going on in my life or around the world. Um, when I have to force myself to sit down and write, very, very difficult. But the way I kind of overcome that is I almost have to remove myself from the writing process and tell the genius in me, who is by my side right here, that it's time for us to go to work, <laughs> and that I'm ready, and I'm going to be the scribe. So when you remove yourself from the equation, it's a liberating feeling, because then something else takes over. It's not me doing the writing, and my job is just to be the scribe to get the words out. You know, I uh, gave the class that Danielle was in a, uh, a handout, a, essay by Donald Murray who talks about how the writing takes over and ends you up in places you never anticipated. Yes. Sounds like exactly what you're describing. Yeah. Would you conclude with a final reading for us? Yes, I think I would like to share a passage about Ubuntu. It would be really nice for our listeners to get a true essence of what Ubuntu really is. Great. Okay. How do I begin to describe the concept of Ubuntu? My personal journey has been a spirit-led journey that has teleported me to one of the safest and most vibrant cities in the world. Before I came to Wellington, New Zealand, I didn't know my true self, and my storytelling had been perceived as nothing of value. I grew up learning the craft through observation, Watching those around me work hard and try to make an honest living in an environment where storytellers never get the full rewards for their efforts. And then I came to New Zealand. And like an Olympic gold medalist, I started the race with no shoes. I found my shoes in Wellington. I feel that I can win this race. I can see the finish line and victory is mine. Finally, I'm in a time and a space where I can realize my full potential a place that gives me the opportunity to express myself through the universal language that is storytelling. My coming to this part of the world has been a unique crossing over of oceans, a crossing over of mountains, of cultures, and a crossing over from nightmare to dreams. The biggest challenge faced by any immigrant in a new country is the frustration of not being understood. We create literally expression from our context of our pasts, our culture, our upbringing, and in essence, our very being. What is important is that we remain true to ourselves and allow the creative energy within to flow. We have, le we have to learn to find innovative ways of marketing ourselves. We need to learn how to network and find maximum exposure and hopefully to fulfill our dreams. We need to learn to utilize technology such as the internet and to look for opportunities around the country and around the world. Ubuntu is a Zulu word that serves as a spiritual foundation of African societies. It is the unification of a world vision inscribed in a Zulu maxim that says, Ubuntu nga muntu nga vantu. A person is a person through other persons. Ubuntu articulates the basic respect and compassion for others. I'm happy to say that I have found Ubuntu right here in New Zealand. From the day I got off the plane, I have met people who have extended a helping hand when I needed it. I have met people who have shown me the way when I got lost, and who have introduced me to other people and so expanded my network of business associates and friends. So I ask you, in a world full of people, why should there be hunger? In a world full of people, why should we feel lost? 
in a world full of people, why do we experience loneliness? Why should there be wars in a world full of people? Why are we still dying of this dreaded disease called AIDS? This is my question. If men and women could only feel for each other the way the world would be in perfect harmony and balance. If we all practice Ubuntu on a daily basis, there would be a group solidarity. There should be respect, compassion, human dignity, and a humanitarian orientation in all things. Let's go back to the way we were. If Africa is the cradle of humanity, let us learn the old ways from her. Although Africa can never go back to her pre-colonial starting point, we have the ability to re-establish contact with the very essence of her being. The person with Ubuntu is open and available to others and is affirming of others. A person with Ubuntu has the self-assurance that comes from knowing that they belong to a greater whole and are not diminished when others are humiliated and diminished, when others are tortured, prosecuted or oppressed. So this simply is my message. A person is a person through other people. Let's revive and practice Ubuntu. Thank you. Thank Ubuntu. You. <laughs> that was Gertrude Machi reading from Born on the Continent, her memoir. Uh, Gertrude, for our listeners, will you remind us how we can follow your career and uh, have access to your writings? My website is africaaliveonline.com. Africa Alive. Online.com. And if people want to Facebook me, please do. But you have to mention that you listen to the show, otherwise I will not friend you. <laughs> I get thousands of invitations on Facebook because of my presentations and talks. So Facebook is a great platform to connect with people. Indeed. I guess our show needs a Facebook page, doesn't it? <laughs> my guest today has been Gertrude Matchy. Thanks so much for speaking with us today, Gertrude. Thank you. And thanks to Danielle Kayser for your participation today. Thank you. This has been Literature Out Loud, sponsored by RMU Radio and Rune, the Robert Morris University Literary Magazine. I'm John Lawson. Thanks for listening. <laughs>